just guide us through the context of what we're talking about today. We've seen most of our material or ideas in Kenya replicated all over the globe. We had a huge, uh, uh, um, we were vocal about it on social media when we saw Louis Vuitton using our Maasai designs, using our beads uh, with other fashion uh, uh, companies. Help us understand what we're working with for today's conversation. Okay, so generally intellectual property protects the expression of ideas. And we have the conventional you know, intellectual property protections like copyright, trademark, industrial design. And now there's this you know, um, area that's emerging about cultural expression and traditional knowledge. Um, now it's becoming a very murky area because you know, even like in the, in the African context, we're looking at who owns what and it's a very pertinent you know, conversation we need to have first. You know, there's been general assumptions that uh, you know, or understanding that some of the things that we are used to, some of the cultural expressions and the things, you know, way of doing things has been normal, you know, public knowledge or it belongs to everyone. So now with this new conversation about cultural rights and communities owning, you know, some cultural aspects becomes a bit, you know, challenging and confusing. Yeah. Right. Uh, now, help us understand there are three levels to this. There's the public sector, there's uh, the technical training institutions, and there's the government. Why isn't the government taking this as much mm -hmm. into their hands? We've seen them incentivize businesses to come on and trademark, but we're still seeing the private sector taking the bulk of this conversation to make it a national policy. Um, I think the challenge has been also the, the lack of understanding on various divides. Um, and uh, because the, the private sector is more proactive in trying to find you know, where the money is, they tend to have an upper hand because they spend money on research and development and just trying to understand the different laws and how they can navigate the space. So then to that, it works to the detriment of you know, the smaller businesses. And sometimes with government and bureaucracies, uh, the processes take a bit too much, you know, a bit long. So by the time they decide to do something, I mean, it's a bit too late. Uh, but research, for sure, is something very important. Public participation is something also that needs to happen because you cannot try and legislate, um, you know, create new laws when you have not spoken to the people and understood, you know, what they understand and where they are coming from and how they would like the laws to protect them. Right. Speaking of understanding, uh, let's now touch on the costs attached to it. Now, you mentioned at the top uh, regarding the different levels of patenting and, of course, trademarking and uh, how we need to understand uh, uh, protecting our ideas. But guide us through uh, mm. what we need to be concerned most uh, regarding the cost element of this. So, you see, it depends with the kind of protection that you seek. A patent is the highest form of protection. It takes about two years before you secure uh, some sort of protection. And, you know, a patent means that you are the person in the whole world who has thought of this innovation. So it is novel, it is new, it is industrially applicable. So, of course, that is the highest and most, uh, you know, expensive process. And that's also because there's uh, the process of, you know, um, patent drafting. You know, what are you claiming from this invention? And it's a very intricate process. So definitely it would be a bit you know, uh, pocket heavy, but it means for the next, you know, about 22 years in your in your business life, you will have been protected and enjoy exclusivity of that creation. Um, trademarks and copyright tend to be a little bit more affordable, uh, but trademarks, uh, you know, it's the exclusive use of a name, a logo, a brand, uh, you know, anything that you create to brand your product. And then copyright is uh, the expression of an idea. We are talking about artistic works. We are talking about sculptures. We are talking about paintings, movies, music. Uh, so, you know, because copyright is inherent, but now there's a registration system that most governments have employed, you know, because the issue of, uh, you know, two people trying to fight over ownership, you know, of, of maybe, you know, some sort of music, the first to register, you know, has, you know, the upper advantage, you know, it's almost like having a title deed. Um, and then it's something, it's very important to note that intellectual property is territorial. So if you've protected it in Kenya, it doesn't automatically mean that you will, it's, you know, it's yours in, in Uganda or in Tanzania. You have to go to Tanzania and register there. You have to go to, you know, Zimbabwe or wherever it is that you want to commercialize. So the, it's very important that people understand that it's only protected in the country of registration. 
Right, um, about five years ago when this conversation surfaced, we had the KIPI, the Kenya Intellectual Property Institute, uh, take focal, uh, uh, be the focal point for this conversation on patenting. But after that, we saw the Kenya Climate Innovation Center, United Nations Environmental Program, ICT Innovation Hub, partner for dissemination of uh, IP knowledge. Is this the case? People might be confused on where exactly to go or where to pay or where to file their documents. Help us understand this. Okay, so... You know, in the intellectual property is divided into two. There is the industrial property, and then there is copyright. So copyright would have a, a separate government entity. In Kenya, we're talking about the Kenya Copyright Board. And then for the industrial property, where we're talking about the patents, the trademarks, and uh, something I didn't mention as well, industrial designs, which protect the beauty of some of the creations that we, we, know, we create, you know, like clutch bags, uh, you know, jewelry. Uh, then you would go to the Kenyan city of... of uh, Industrial Property Institute, my apologies, KIPI, where you would now do the processes. Um, and they have different forms that are available online for you to also review and understand what you need to do. Um, and the process begins from the search stage because what happens is uh, KIPI, the, you know, the officials would look at their register to confirm that nobody else has registered what you're trying to register. And then after that, you know, it goes through the application proce process and thereafter you get your certificate. Um, and the, year, the years can range, like patents, I said, about two years. Trademarks is about uh, six months to eight months. Same with industrial design. Right, fantastic. Let's talk about your fashion event uh, that is set to happen on December 11th. Now, this is uh, IP high tea. We know about the fashion high tea, but this is an IP high tea with only 40 slots, if I'm not wrong. Just help us understand why only 40 yes. and the context of conversation that we will be having at the event. Okay, so why 40? First of all, um, it was a bit difficult, you know, owing to the political climate to find, you know, uh, sponsors to help me push this event forward. Um, and I feel like it's uh, the time to have these conversations, especially in the fashion and the beauty industry. We have a lot of smaller businesses trying to come up and, you know, trying to use some of their knowledge and ingenuity to create products and, be, you know, and just build brands. But the challenge has been they don't understand intellectual property. And without, without that understanding, then it's very, different. It's very difficult to, you know, for them to scale up. I will give an example of um, Sarah Dior from Senegal. She did a very beautiful clutch bag, uh, but it seems she had not created it. And someone had access to it from Yves Saint Laurent. And Yves Saint Laurent just launched a beautiful, similar clutch bag. And she was just left, you know, crying to social media and saying, you know, they stole my designs, they did X, Y, and Z. But you see, if you are ignorant of the law, then it become, it's not a defense, you know? And it's just some of the conversations I'm trying to have with the people in the fashion and beauty space. Most of them think that, you know, just because other brands are getting knocked off, that then the law does not protect them, which is not true. Um, so I'm just trying to, you know, get them, you know, more aware of such and all other laws that would be involved, you know, consumer protection laws, uh, especially now for the bloggers, because... You know, some of these brands are also using bloggers to, you know, review their products, but they need to do it in a diligent manner so that they don't find themselves, you know, in legal trouble or they find themselves in jail, you know. So it's very important for me to sort of help have this conversation. It's the first time we're having it in Kenya and possibly in the Eastern Africa region. And um, my hope is to, to have more of them because if the SMEs and individuals are not having these conversations and are not proactive in finding this knowledge, then it is to their detriment, you know? When you're trying to, you know, get an investor also, you need to be investor ready. How are you investor ready? This is information you need to have. Yeah. Right. Oh, perfect. My final point, I'll just jam it in together for the interest of time. Um, most technical training institutions do not have IP in their curriculum. Comment on that and then, who now penalizes the Louis Vuittons and all these companies across the world who have their trademarks in uh, when they use some of the designs and ideas from this part of the world, since you mentioned that it's uh, a nation-centered or well within a country's borders? So because intellectual property is a personal right, it has to come from the rights holder. So the person who had taken the step to protect this intellectual property, if they have done it in a proper manner, in a legal fashion, then they would be the ones to sort of, you know, now hire a lawyer and be proactive in, in policing their intellectual property and ensuring that they, you know, go to court and sue these, uh, you know, perpetrators of intellectual property infringement. So, you know, unless, if, if we were to find a better way to approach, you know, 
traditional cultural expressions perhaps then maybe the government might come in place but we are a bit uh, you know we are yet to have that conversation to really find out how we would execute it but as far as you know the personal brands that are concerned the individual brands it would be the individuals themselves they have to take you know uh, they have to be proactive what? just like you know when someone tries to steal something from you you would go you know to court and find a way to get it back yeah Right, for the interest of time, we're not able to, to get about that conversation on having the IP in the curriculum for technical training institutions. But thank you very much for being very concise and uh, getting through as much as possible with that conversation. Liz Lenjo, partner at Kikao Law, 